One other announcement I want to let you know about is uh, our nursery ministry has two part-time positions open. You have to be 18 years old or older. And uh, this is not just babysitting over there. This is ministry. And so we want to let you know that there's some part-time positions open. If you are interested or know somebody that's interested, pass on the information. They can see Mandy Young or Gabe Yost. They can also email Gabe at gabe at redeemerpv.com to get details and to schedule an interview. This is important. What happens in the nursery is actual ministry. That's not just babysitting in there so that we can have real church in here. There's real ministry happening over there and you get to be a part of that helping to form the next generation and pass our faith on to the next generation. Many of you are familiar with Chuck Colson, the founder of Prison uh, Ministry Fellowship. He's passed away now. But in his years of doing prison ministry, they discovered that the biggest cause of crime is a failure to train during the morally formative years. And so that's what's happening over there. I tell Mandy all the time that the people that work in our nursery department should not be called nursery workers. They should be called crime fighters. They need to have, you know, they need to have an inn on here for nursery and a cape and all that. I mean, they're like crime fighters over there. We want you to be a crime fighter also. So help us to pass our faith on to the next generation. Email Gabe to get more information and pass it on to somebody that might be interested. I want to ask Dr. Julie McKay to come and join me for just a moment. Uh, many of you guys know Dr. McKay. Her and Mark have been a part of the church for many years and have served in a lot of different capacities. But what you may not know is that Julie spends a lot of time serving and volunteering with Samaritan's Purse. And she spent many years overseas. In fact, one, uh, one thing, she went right to the front lines during the COVID outbreak, which she'll talk about in just a moment, in Italy. Spent a month over there right at the worst time in the worst part of the world during that big outbreak. Recently, she was deployed. Only a few of us knew this because it was, it was a very clandestine type of uh, outreach. But she was deployed to Ukraine. And she was serving there for some time with Samaritan's Purse and now is about to be deployed on another very important uh, outreach that I wanted to let her share, share with you about. Thank you, Sean. So uh, does anybody remember what happened on March 13th, 2020? Of course we do. It was the day the TPC shut down of to Of course, the TPC. That's what I was thinking. <laughs> because of a mysterious virus called covid it was also the day that Samaritan Purse called me to deploy me to an emergency field hospital in Cremona, Italy, where the death rate was absolutely astronomical. Several important things happened at this hospital. One, we saw multiple miraculous healings, but Sean, I'll leave that to another day. The other <laughs> I like thing, to hear those stories too. <laughs> the other thing that happened was also amazing and super important. At that time in northern Italy, there were multiple evangelical churches, but they were not communicating with each other at all. In fact, they did not even know each other existed. But when those churches and the Italian people recognized that it was an evangelical mission group that raced to their crisis to help them, and with the groundwork that was being laid by the Billy Graham evangelist chaplains who accompanied us, many barriers were broken down and several of the evangelical churches banded together and formed a very solid and strong network to mentor new Christians who were coming out of the hospital and also to <clears throat> water the seeds of the other patients that we had seen and started to explain the gospel to. Fast forward two and a half years, there are now 550 evangelical churches through from Rome to northern Italy that have unified together. They have subsequently hosted three enormous teenage revivals, seeing thousands of teenagers in Italy come to know the Lord as their Savior. Praise God. Not only that, but they have, these 550 churches have trained 4,000 men and women in discipleship training so that they're comfortable explaining their faith in God to everyone they meet. On October 29th, they are hosting a festival which turns out to be like a Billy Graham crusade. And it's called the Noe Festival. Noe is an Italian word that means us or we or united in different settings. So a united Italy festival. Italy united. Italy united. And uh, this festival is already sold out, all 12,500 seats, and I am honored and humbled 
to be invited to attend with Franklin Graham, Edward Graham, and uh, five other people to represent Samaritan Purse and to speak at both the nationally televised press conference and the festival. And uh, we're hoping and praying that, and I ask you to join me in praying that the God will continue to unite the evangelical churches there, that they will proclaim one God, one gospel, one church, and that they will continue to uh, have an impact, a lasting impact on the people of northern Italy, in all of Italy, really, and more people will come to know and love the Lord through this festival. Can we just do that right now and pray for Julie and for that outreach? Yeah, you can applaud. That's exciting what's happening there. Um, but, you know, this is one of the things that we get to do is to stand in agreement and to pray for that ministry and the outreach. And you can see how important it is to go in and meet people's actual needs, their felt needs, their physical needs, and how that opens the door for them to even be concerned about what their spiritual needs might be. So would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for Dr. McKay. God, I thank you for Julie's willingness to take the skill and the education that she's had and to use that to advance your kingdom to serve others. God, we pray, thank you for the sacrifice that she makes of her time to go to these places. We pray that you would be with her as she travels, that you would watch over her, protect her in this time. God, we thank you for the unity that's happening in Italy, the churches that are coming together. We pray that you would just continue to bless that ministry, bless that outreach. And as they go and they, they share in this context, Lord, I pray that you would anoint Julia she stands up to speak, that you would give her your words, that she would step into that anointing and that she would speak with confidence, she would speak with boldness in a way that would touch people's hearts and draw them to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. I'm very proud of you. How many of you remember the movies, the Indiana Jones movies? A couple people? Okay, listen, we really need to work on our responsiveness. I said this last week, and you did pretty good, um, but we really, it's okay to be responsive. Uh, you know, even during prayer time when Kathleen was praying, I felt like I was speaking out in agreement, but it's okay. We could be vocal. Uh, there, <laughs> thank you, Saul. Uh, some less vocal. No, just kidding. Be vocal. I, I want the feedback. So how many of you seen the Indiana Jones movies? All right. There we go. And you can comment at home just in the chat. You can make your opinions there. Um, it's better than I don't see them. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. I do see them. Um, back on track. Indiana Jones. The one movie that I really liked of, the, of all of those Indiana Jones movies was uh, the Temple of, or the um, Last Crusade. Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. That's the one with Sean Connery. And there's this scene where they go into the cave, and there's this knight there. He's the, he's the proctor of the Holy Grail. He's keeping it safe from people that would come seeking. You guys remember the scene? And there's another guy also coming in. So you've got this guy named Donovan, who's this greedy, selfish Nazi guy. And then you've got Indiana Jones who's coming in. These are the two guys coming in. And the knight says something amazing as they come in. He says, listen, choose wisely. For while the true grail brings life, the false grail will take it from you. And you remember what happened? Donovan goes in and he's got these selfish motives and ambitions and he's thinking like a selfish person thinks and he grabs like the most expensive looking chalice and he drinks it and what happens? He dies, just to put it mildly, he dies. And in that moment after this very dramatic death scene, the knight says, he chose poorly. I love that. Like, yeah, you, know, you think? He chose poorly, that's an understatement. And then, of course, Dr. Jones chooses. Well, like, like those guys in the story, Donovan and Indiana Jones, there are two types of wisdom that we can choose from, and we need to choose wisely, because one is from above and one is not. One leads to life and one does not. One is from above, one is not. And that's what James is addressing in the portion of scripture that we're going to look at today, James chapter 3. James, at least that's his English name, his actual Hebrew name is Jacob, and he's the brother of Jesus. But James, at the beginning of his letter, identifies himself as a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. James is pastoring the oldest Christian congregation that we know of in Jerusalem, and James is actually the oldest writing in the New Testament. And he's writing this to Jews that are scattered throughout these Gentile regions. And he identifies himself as a bondservant of Jesus Christ. Because James understands that it's his spiritual relationship with Jesus that matters, not his earthly relationship. And already we're seeing the difference between the spiritual and the earthly. The heavenly and the 
uh, the, the, not of heaven, not from above. And James is structured around 10 lessons on wisdom. And each one of these lessons has an illustration. We've looked at five already. And then what we're going to look at today in James chapter 3 is really the central bullseye of the entire letter. The five lessons on wisdom before and the five after are really structured around this idea, this concept that we're going to look at today. So it sort of breaks from the pattern to make this statement because this is like the piece that pulls all these together. And the first week we looked at wisdom and trials, how to, how to think about when we walk through difficulty. Lesson two was wisdom and avoiding worthless religion. There is a type of religion that's just vain. It's empty. It's ritualistic and routine. And James talks about how to avoid that. And the third lesson on wisdom, he talks about wisdom and favoritism. How we're supposed to treat people and not show favoritism to others. And the fourth lesson is wisdom and works. That faith is demonstrated by a changed life. And then the fifth one was wisdom in our words. That's the one we looked at last week. And that's a very difficult one because taming the tongue is difficult. Uh, or as Eastman Curtis calls it, the beef between our teeth. Uh, it gets us into a, a lot of trouble, right? We can tame all kinds of wild animals, but taking control of our tongue is very difficult. Proverbs, which James is actually referred to as the Proverbs of the New Testament. But Proverbs chapter 10 says, when words are many, sin is not absent. But he who holds his tongue is wise. It's so smart there. James talked about that earlier in this, in this letter. He says, to be a ready listener, slow to speak. Because we've all said things that we regret, that we wish we could get back, that we feel badly about, that as the words are coming out, we're trying to get them, but we can't, now they're out there. And this is something I realize that all of us are working on. All of us here today, we love God. That's why we're here. We're trying to understand more about who we are in God. We're trying to spend time devoted to his word. And I understand that, but we're also still in process. We still haven't got control of all this. Even Paul says this in Philippians. He says, therefore, my dear friends, as you've always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now even in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. It's something that we're constantly working on. And getting a grip on our tongue is something that we're probably constantly going to be working on. Our words are powerful. They have the ability to magnify. They can magnify God or complaining can magnify our circumstances. And this week we're going to pick it up in verse 13. James chapter 3, verse 13. And as I said, this is really the central bullseye of his entire letter. James chapter 3, verse 13. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but it is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find every disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness." So here, this is the word of the Lord. So here James is contrasting true wisdom and false wisdom and pointing out that wisdom is not just knowledge, it's living it out. It's seen in our actions. Just like he said in, with faith, show me your faith and I'll show you faith by my, by my actions, by my works. It has to translate into how you live. The same also is true with wisdom. Wisdom is applied knowledge. Wisdom is acting on what you know. If you're writing something down, write that down. Wisdom is acting on what you know. It's much different than knowledge. The highest, most blessed use of the tongue is to convey wisdom, is what most Bible commentaries would comment about in this portion of scripture. We've already seen that true wisdom is a gift of God. James chapter, five, or James chapter one, verse five, he says, ask God, if you lack, lack wisdom, ask God and he'll give it to you. In 1 Kings chapter three, King Solomon, as he's about to become king and he realizes he now has this great responsibility of leading this nation, in a dream, God asks Solomon, he says, anything you want, ask me and I'll, I'll, I'll give it to you. And Solomon, in his dream, when God says, ask anything and I'll give it to you, he asks for wisdom. 
And in his dream, God says, because you didn't ask for riches and all these other things, but you asked for wisdom, I'm gonna give you both. He understood how important wisdom was. In fact, in Proverbs, he says, wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And with all you're getting, get understanding. Who is wise and understanding among you? Verse 13. And that word understanding could also be translated knowledgeable. Who is wise and knowledgeable among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in humility that comes from wisdom. If I were to ask you that question, who is wise among you? Who would you think of? Who would you say? Who, would someone come to mind or a type of person come to mind? Maybe somebody that's very educated, somebody that's intellectual, maybe somebody that's just really smart, maybe somebody that's older comes to mind. Who is wise and knowledgeable among you? And this is an important distinction. Wisdom is different than intellect or knowledge. Knowledge is knowing something. Wisdom is acting on the knowledge. For example, knowledge is knowing that a tomato is actually not fruit. Tomato is a veg. Wait, I said that wrong. <laughs> tomato is actually not a vegetable. Tomato is a fruit. That's knowledge. Wisdom is knowing not to put it in a fruit salad. <laughs> Think about that. <laughs> tomato is a fruit, but you don't put it in a fruit salad. You put it with an actual salad of vegetables. Anyway, knowledge, knowledge builds the Titanic. Wisdom avoids the iceberg. That requires humility, and that's what he says here. This is humility that comes from wisdom. You have the knowledge to build this incredible ship. They called it the unsinkable ship, and so there was an amount of arrogance and pride that went along with that. And this forged ahead, even though there was danger. And wisdom is, okay, this may be true. We have the knowledge to build this great thing, but let's not just be arrogant about it and forge ahead. Let's actually pay attention. Let's actually be wise and not just try to get there the fastest and, you know, and have this great record that we've achieved or something, but that we actually get there safely. Wisdom avoids the iceberg. Some, someone may have knowledge of the Bible, and that's important, but that's a lot different than walking with God. Wisdom is walking with God. It's not just knowing about the Bible, but walking with God, that it's seen in our lives. Being a follower of Jesus can be seen in your life, the deeds done in humility that come from wisdom. And the way the ESV translates it, it says, who is wise and understanding among you by his good conduct, letting, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. I love that idea. Meekness is not weakness. Actually, meekness is strength with, rest strength with restraint. God is meek. True wisdom is evident in its meek manner. Those who do their good works in a way that is designed to bring attention to ourselves is a lack of wisdom. Verse 14, and if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. And see, this is really the real issue. It's in the heart. What's going on in our heart? Envy, selfish ambition. He goes on to say, such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. This is important what James identifies here is he identifies what is the actual enemy of godly wisdom? What is the enemy of the wisdom that comes from above? And I love the way actually it's translated in the King James Version. It says this, this wisdom is earthly, sensual, and devilish. And I like it that way because it really identifies the three enemies of wisdom from above. The world, the philosophies of this world, those are enemies of godly wisdom. Uh, the flesh, my own ego, my own selfish ambition, it's earthly, sensual, and devilish. We have their spiritual warfare. These are the enemies of the wisdom that comes from above. The world, the flesh, and the devil. The, the world philosophies, and there are things to be learned that way, but the philosophies of this world are often in conflict and contrary to God's word. And so is my own ego. The impulses of my own flesh are often in conflict to that wisdom. And of course, the spiritual warfare is. So it's important to recognize that. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. See, when you have envy and selfish ambition, in a way, it's like this is what opens Pandora's box. You have that opened up, and it opens up all kinds of stuff. 
It's the can of worms that opens it all. That's why when you make decisions based out of selfish ambition or envy, you often make decisions that are wrong that bring harm to you or harm to others. That's why when they ask Jesus what's the most important law and all the law, most important law, Jesus says to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. The second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. And he says all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Everything hinges on this. Because if every decision you make is motivated out of a love for God and a love for others, you'll most often make right decisions. It's when my decision is motivated out of fear, out of envy, out of selfishness, out of my own ego, that's when I make wrong decisions. And then that has a domino effect in my life. It opens the door to all kinds of other things. In fact, the Apostle Paul said in his letter to the Philippians, do nothing from selfish ambition. That doesn't mean a person should not have ambition. This is selfish ambition or conceit. But in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to your own interest, but also to the interest of others. It's okay to look to your own interest, but not only to your own interest, also to the interest of others. The wisdom that is from above is first of all pure, then peaceable and gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. This is how you can recognize when it's wisdom from above. It's pure. What does that mean? It means it's free from defilement. It's not mixed with my own selfish opinions. My opinions are not gospel. And so many of us, we mix these things together. We mix the Bible with our own opinions. We mix the Bible with our own culture. You see this, missionaries, you see this when you go across culturally, how we try to go over and Americanize people and we associate our American political views with the gospel and it's not even relevant there. They don't care in Thailand about some of the political things that we care about here or how we do it in America, right? So, but we mix these things together. It's important to separate those things out and to understand that. It's pure. It's, God's wisdom is pure. It's not mixed with my own opinions, my own selfish opinions. It's peaceable. And the, and the word here, that it could be translated this way, not provoking. Have you ever noticed that we know how to push somebody else's buttons? Especially people close to you, people in your family. You know how to say it just a way that gives a little jab. You know it's going to make them react and you're going to look like, I didn't do anything. I just, no, you just pushed the button. You knew not to push the button, you pushed the button. You see this with kids, right? They know how to push those buttons and then act like they're innocent about it. They didn't do, we all have seen it. This past week, um, we have a great relationship with the farm next door with Fantasy Farm. And they use, they use our, our parking lot for some of their events, and they allow us to use the farm for things like the fall festival coming up. There's all kinds of animals over there and things to look at. And they actually paved the walkway between the church and the farm now, so it's very easy to get over. And then once a year, they come over, and they give a nice donation to the church just you know, to, c- to cultivate that relationship. And they came by this week and, uh, to bring that donation just to say thank you for the relationship. And they a- offered to take us over there and show us some of the improvements they've made. So as we're walking through, uh, there's a family of ring-tailed lemurs that are there now. And then they're fun to watch, right? They're all over the place. So there's this whole group of them, and then there's this one, one in a cage all by himself. And I asked, why is he over there? And they go, oh, that's Crazy Uncle. <laughs> His name is actually Crazy Uncle. And why are you all laughing? Because you probably all have a Crazy Uncle. <laughs> and you know he needs to be in that cage also. They call, the reason they call him crazy uncle is because as they had them together, this one lemur would constantly pick fights with the other ones. And then they would all gang up on him and beat him up. And he just knew how to push their buttons. I mean, each one of them, he'd just tweak them, push their buttons, and they'd all gang up on him. They had to separate crazy uncle. I went over to look in his cage and go, hey, crazy uncle. And he comes right up to the cage, and he literally looks like his eyes are like, bleh, bleh. I mean, he looks like a crazy uncle. I was like, that kid's not right. (laughs) He knew how to push the buttons. Well, I want to encourage you, wisdom that comes from above is not like crazy uncle. It's not pushing the buttons. It's peaceable. We're not looking to push people's buttons. Gentle, it goes on to say, is peaceable and gentle. 
A gentle also is strength with restraint as well. I said that about meekness, but that could say be said about gentleness as well. It's strength with restraint. Some of your translations may say considerate. And I like that translation a lot. Consider, because it takes, it takes a humility to consider somebody, else, somebody else's point of view, where they might be coming from. Not forcing my own opinion, not being a bully about something but actually taking time to consider where they might be coming from. Isn't that what James said earlier in James chapter one? He says to be quick to listen, slow to speak. That's still something that even though we talked about it a few weeks ago, it's still something that probably hasn't found its way down into all of your behavior. It's hard to do sometimes. And this is also reminding us this, the idea of this being gentle is to be be a person that is considerate of other people's point of view. I want to share something with you for a moment and just to kind of break the message, then I'll jump back into the message and wrap it up. And this is a prayer that helps me. It's a different kind of prayer. And it's a prayer that helps me as far as my perspective about people. Because it's easy to react sometimes to people's behavior. In Youthquake, uh, when we train our, our leaders, and especially our college age interns, and these interns are now leading high school and middle school kids, but they're not that much further along. They're not that much mature. Just last year, some of them were in high school, and now here they are interns. And we're trying to train them how to lead this cast. And one of the things we constantly remind them is this. Whatever you see on the surface of a teenager's behavior, you're not aware of the variables that are playing into that equation that you don't see. We have to remember that all the time because it's so easy to react sometimes to somebody's behavior But if we stop to realize there's something else perhaps factoring into that, it will change the way we approach that person. It will give us compassion. It will give us grace in dealing with them. And this is a prayer that helps me to remember to do this constantly. James is very straightforward. This prayer is very honest and straightforward as well. Heavenly Father, Please help me to remember that the jerk who cut me off in traffic is actually a single mom who worked nine hours that day and is rushing home to cook dinner, help with homework, do laundry, and spend a few precious moments with her children. God, help me to remember that the disinterested young man at the store who can't even make change correctly is a worried 19-year-old college student who is balancing his apprehension for his final exam with his fear of not getting his student loan next year. Heavenly Father, help me to remember that the scary looking guy begging for money in the same spot every day who I think really ought to go get a job is a slave to addictions that I cannot even imagine in my worst nightmare. God, help me to remember that the older couple walking annoyingly slow in the aisle blocking my shopping progress are savoring the moment, knowing that because of a biopsy report she received last week, this is their last year they will shop together. Heavenly Father, remind us that of all the gifts you give us, the greatest gift is love. And it's not enough to only share this with those we hold dear. Open our hearts to not only those who are close to us, but to all humanity. May we be slow to judge and quick to forgive. Help us to see people the way you do, not a problem to avoid, but a person to be loved. Grant us wisdom from above. Amen. If we pray like that, we'll become wise. If we pray like that, then we'll respond to people from a right place in our hearts, not from our selfish motives. Be gentle. Open to reason is the next part here. And the idea of being open to reason, in some translations it says submissive, which is appropriate because you're yielding to somebody else. And this idea is that you're open to reason, that you listen to somebody else's perspective. Ephesians chapter 5 Verse 21, it says, submit one to another out of reverence for Christ. You take time to listen to somebody else's point of view, to their perspective. Costa Dier, who I've referenced many times, he was, a, he was from Palestine. He was a missionary for over 50 years. 
he was a professor at Elam Bible College up in New York, and he had a house here in Jacksonville Beach where he would come and write books. He wrote a lot of books on leadership. And this guy, if you guys know me, you know I love Star Wars, he was like a literally human Yoda. He was like this big, he had bald, he was bald, pointy ears, and everything he said was like a riddle. You know, when 900 years old you are, look as good you will not, you know. (laughs) But he always had these little sayings. And one time he said, a wise leader, we're talking about wisdom that's from above, a wise leader can receive criticism even from his worst enemy. And he goes on to explain that because almost always there is a shred of truth in every criticism, even if it's from your enemy, much less somebody that's close to you. But what most of us do is if you criticize me and 90% of what you say is true and 10% is false, I go, that's not true. I'm not listening to that because that's false. That's wrong. You're wrong. I'm just reacting to that instead of listening to what's true. But what Costa is saying is if you're wise, even if 90% of what you say is wrong and 10% is right, I'm going to listen to the 10% that's right. Even if you say it in a wrong attitude, even if you say it in a wrong tone of voice, that what a wise leader will do is listen. You're open to reason. You're submissive. You're submitted to God, to his word, to others, and you're listening for that shred of truth because almost Never is criticism 100% fabricated. Perhaps sometimes it is, but almost always it isn't. There's usually some truth in there. And if we're going to grow, if we're going to mature, which is the point of James' letter, then we need to listen to that. We need to benefit from that. We need to allow the Holy Spirit to show us what is true and then let go of what is false and not react to it. And then keep no record of wrong about it. 1 Corinthians 13 says, love keeps no record of wrongs. Most of us do. I was talking to this one guy. He told me, he said, my wife is so historical. I said, do you mean hysterical? She said, no, historical. She's always bringing up my past. (laughs) Love keeps no record of wrongs. We need to be full of mercy because we need a lot of mercy. I need to sow a lot of mercy because I know I need a lot of mercy. And then it goes on to say impartial and sincere. And both of these words, they're grouped together. And both of these words in the Greek are associated with the opposite of hypocrisy. And hypocrisy is a, was a Greek actor, a hypocrite was a Greek actor who would wear different masks. So what James is saying here is don't be that way, don't be fake. It doesn't mean you're not ever going to get it wrong and not do something that you shouldn't do and that kind of thing. But it means don't be fake about it. Be authentic. Be real. And what I love about our church, and in many churches in our area, I think, are this way as well, is that we acknowledge that we don't have it all together. We're not coming in here acting like we have it all together. We all understand we don't. We're on this journey together. I remember one time... Uh, I had a great relationship with, with my father, but at one point when my faith and some things that I was working through were sort of a conflict for him, he told me one time, he said, you know, you're, you're a hypocrite. You're just like, and he named some other people, and I go, I know, I am. That's why I need a savior. He goes, oh, that's a good answer. <laughs> I'm like, I'm not gonna fight with that. I am, I know, I, so are you. You know, well, that's why we need a savior. As we had some great conversations as a result of that. But the point I want to make to you today is we're just all in this together. We're working on it together. Let's just be real about it, impartial and sincere. And then he goes on to say peacemakers who sow in peace and reap a harvest of righteousness. Or as it says in the New King James, now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. What does that mean for me and you? How does that demonstrate wisdom from above? Here's the way that I look at it. I can't make everybody's conflict not be a conflict. I can't fix everybody's problem. But can I de-escalate the anxiety? Can I sow peace? Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. So it's just to come in and to be able to help de-escalate this, not adding to the situation. Some of us do the opposite. We want to squirt lighter fluid on it and make it flame up. Don't do that. How can I... So peace. 
Make me an instrument of peace so that I can help de-escalate the anxiety or the problem or the conflict. How can I sow peace? I know that, I don't know about you, but I love, I love powerful prophetic preaching. You guys like powerful prophetic preaching? I love that too. I love, you know what else I love? I love the Baptist three points in an illustration. That's very helpful. For, for me, it's helpful because I can remember three points in an illustration. I can walk out of here and do it, you know what I mean? That helps me. I like inspirational, motivational preaching that just, it, it touches my emotions and inspires me to do something. I like that. I understand that today was a little bit different. It was more of a conversational walking through the text. But in preaching like this we're doing right now, this expository preaching, going through an entire book of the Bible, sometimes you just have to go where the text takes you. And I hope that you receive that today. This was more just a conversational walking through this text. And it's important because the way this letter of James is structured is you have these five lessons on wisdom. And then this little piece right here in the middle, this is the central bullseye. It's like we want to tone it down. We want to bring it in. We want to focus on this. All of you can be wise. And then we're going to get back into the five lessons of wisdom that come after this. But all of you can be wise here today. What we need to do is ask God. Knowledge comes from education. Wisdom comes from God. We need to be connected to the source. And then the next thing is we need to actually do it, live it out. That's a James point. Jesus said this, Matthew chapter 7, uh, verse 24 through 27. You guys know it's a famous parable. He talks about the wise man who built his house upon the rock. You guys know the wise man built his house upon the rock. The fool built his house on the sand. He goes on through this whole parable. And what Jesus, the point he makes is the wise man is the one who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice. The one who has the knowledge and applies it and does it. It's not just knowledge, it's doing it. The fool is the one who has the knowledge and doesn't do it, who hears these words of mine and doesn't put them into practice. This is what Jesus says in that parable, and this is what the point James is making today. How do we have that kind of wisdom? We have to be connected to the source of wisdom, the wisdom that's from above. Not the earthly, unspiritual, demonic wisdom, but the spiritual that is from above. We have to be connected to the source. And then we have to do what it says. How can we be wise? Be connected to the source and do what it says. How can you walk out of here today and be wiser tomorrow than you all are today? Be connected to the source and do what it says. You do that, you're gonna be wise. You're gonna have the wisdom that comes from above. Colossians chapter three, or chapter two, Paul says this, my goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Being connected to the source in Jesus are all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Being connected to the source and then putting his words into practice in my life then we have the wisdom that's from above. Then we can take the five lessons before, the five lessons yet to come, and live them out. Amen? Would you stand with me as we prepare for communion here in just a moment? And I'm not sure where you are in your own journey today, your own spiritual life. We're gonna pray a prayer here in just a moment, a prayer of surrender, just yielding our lives to Jesus, accepting, receiving, embracing Jesus as our Messiah, as our Savior. And we're gonna pray a prayer of confession, admitting that we all have fallen short, we've all sinned, we've all done our own thing, we've all rebelled. We're gonna pray that prayer together. And I'm I'm gonna lead you, but I wanna encourage you to repeat after me, but you pray it in your own heart. And maybe you've been around church a long time, maybe you've heard these kind of things a long time, but you've never actually done that in your heart, I wanna encourage you to do that today. Or maybe you've just slipped off course a little bit, and today needs to be a, a realignment. Let's pray this prayer together. And then we're going to come to communion. Sam's going to lead us through communion. But would you repeat after me? Heavenly Father, I confess that I have sinned against you in my thoughts, my words, and my actions. Have mercy on me and forgive me through your Son, my Savior. Lord Jesus, I believe you lived on this earth. You died for my sin. You rose and now live. I yield to you, be my Lord 
Holy Spirit, fill me with power and passion to follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. At this time, we would like to invite all those who follow Jesus Christ.